Um, okay, I think that should do it. Okay, ready to go. Well, welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I have to say I'm a little disappointed that this meeting's not in person. I do feel like we've gone back in time a little bit, taken a step backwards, but it's probably the prudent thing to do uh, to at least hold the January meeting uh, as a virtual meeting. So uh, so welcome and, and, and Happy New Year. Um, I call the meeting to order. Uh, Judy, would you please do the roll? Yep, you're on mute. Yep. Okay, I'm all right. Um, Neil Butnett. Here. Judy Neville. Tom Schulte. Here. Amy Carroll. Here. Todd Lavery. Here. Michael Lennon. Here. Chris Bree. Here. Victor Alvarez. Here. Maria Weingarten. Here. And Rob, Robert Hamill's not here. Colin Dobbin. Here. Here. Okay. So we will need to seat. Um, no, we won't need to seat anybody, all present. I, I think we're all good. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Our first uh, order uh, on the first agenda item is actually the election. So, um, Tucker? Yes. Um, so, the first electman, as per the charter, has uh, called the election and nom called for the election and nomination of officers this evening. And he is unable to join us due to travel commitments. So, he has designated me in my capacity as administrative <laughs> officer to conduct the election. So uh, we have the chairman and the secretary, and I would like to now open the floor for nominations for chairman of the Board of Finance. Do I hear okay. any nominations? I have, a, I have a nomination. Okay. I would like to nominate Paul Labieri for chairman again. Second. Judy, second. Are there any other nominations for chairman? Hearing none. I'd now call for a hand vote if it's unanimous, we can do it. Um, let me just let someone in here. Um, so all those in favor of Mr. Lavieri as chairman for the Board of Finance, please raise your hand and keep them up so that we can make sure you're all accounted for. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Any opposed? It is unanimous. Congratulations, Mr. Lavieri. Um, the Thank next. You. Order of business is the nomination and election for a secretary. I'd now like to open the floor for nominations for secretary for the Board of Finance. Well, I, I'll nominate Judy if she's willing. <laughs> so willing. <laughs> All right, Judy Neville as secretary. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, Neil. Again, all in favor and please leave your hands up. Any opposed? And there's no other nominations, correct, for secretary? Okay, seeing none, um, Judy Neville is the secretary for the Board of Finance. That Yay. concludes our elections. Uh, congratulations to all and thank you very much. Oh yeah. All right, well, thank you everybody for your support. I do really appreciate that. Um, I really think this team has worked really hard and done a lot, but it's been terrific teamwork. So I, I really enjoyed all that we've done over these last several years um, and not so easy circumstances. Um, one announcement, uh, we do have a new CFO starting on Tuesday. I think I sent her resume out to you all. I did interview with her and was very impressed. I'm very excited. I mean, Linda was a terrific and is a terrific CFO. Uh, and he'll do very well in Norwalk. But um, anyway, I think we're very lucky and happy to have uh, Ann Kelly Lenz. She, as you remember, uh, was a CFO, uh, not only of Wilton, but also of the school uh, system of the Board of Ed. So uh, she has a dual hat over there, which is very helpful for us to have her have that experience. So anyway, very excited about having her on board uh, starting next week. Um, uh, just one other thing on the budget, well, it's not on the agenda, but just to give everybody a quick update, we're starting to get numbers to come in. Um, Josh has finished the model, I believe, and Josh can send that out to the, to the working group. Um, and then we'll get some uh, thinking out at, by the end of the month. I'm going to try to have a meeting, if I can, uh, discussion with the Board of Ed on where they are. Um, but the, the process begins and I'd like to just uh, get everything in your hands, obviously, the last week of January, so we have time to process everything that we can. Uh, prior to our first uh, set of meetings. And then the first meeting, I'd really like to take the beginning and go through the model and get everybody's you know, thoughts and input and insights uh, as we do that. So that's where we are uh, on that. Okay, uh, let's see. I need a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. 
I have a, I have a, a uh, suggested modification. For the, minute. the minutes, go ahead. Yeah. And this is small, but I think it's important given the discussion we had and given the inflationary period that we're in. Um, under budget, budget guidance, the second paragraph, uh, it states uh, he, meaning uh, Todd, noted a goal for FY23 will be to keep the amount to be raised by taxation in the one to 2% increase range. Um, I don't feel, I think it'd be more appropriate to said, uh, you know, Todd or Ms., you know, the chairman said, his goal would be to be at this range. I don't think I can say that a goal for the, I don't feel comfortable with the goal. For oh, the it industry. was my goal. That's a good correction. I think that's fair. Okay. I, I was just suggesting that as a, as, a, as a starting point, Amy, for the discussion, 100%, okay. you're right, yep. Okay, so it just said he not, his goal, I just from yeah. all his, I think it's minor, <laughs> but I think given the environment, it's important. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I know you want to cut it 5%, um, but that would be your goal. So teasing, um, I, I know, yeah. I noted the change and I'll make the correction. Thank you. Okay, so moved. Any other comments on the minutes? Otherwise, a motion to approve? As amended. Move. Okay, uh, Neil, I'm sorry, second? They raised their hand. Amy, second, okay. All in favor? I, Tucker, do you need us to, what do you need? Just, no, it's, just everybody, I, and if there's anybody, is okay. anybody opposed? Anyone opposed? Okay, then we're good. All in favor. Go. Okay, thanks. Perfect. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay, we have a few important topics that we haven't had updates on in, in some time. Um, the first one, we have Mike and Mike for the New Can Athletic Foundation. Um, and then we'll go to the town players, Waveney Park Conservatory, finance, and then we will go into executive session for our annual IT discussion. Um, but we'll get there when uh, when we get there. So, um, uh, Mike and Mike, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for having us. Um, Mike Murphy's here with me as well. Mike Benevento, chairman of the uh, McKinnon Athletic Foundation. And I'll have a brief update for you guys uh, on three different topics. Uh, first, the field usage or the field rental summary from this past summer, uh, if you recall, as part of the memorandum of understanding that we signed with the town back in 2019, uh, the Athletic Foundation runs the field complex um, and the high school complex as an enterprise zone during the summer in order to raise funds uh, to, uh, to, to put into a turf replacement um, account that we keep at the Community Foundation. Uh, so that we don't run into or we can help supplement the cost of refurbishing that turf uh, when it comes to the end of its useful life. So um, Bobby Rushton runs that enterprise zone for us in the summer. And uh, if you recall, uh, we said that we were going to try to walk, then jog, then run a bit as we got this up and running. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we had another really good year uh, this past summer. And, and all kudos go to Bobby for, for running this because he really drums up all the the business and, and, and runs the operations throughout the entire summer. So um, just to give you a sense of the, the framework back in 2019, um, when we really just started this, we did $30,975 of gross, gross revenue. 2020, 2020 COVID year, uh, but still had a really good summer, did $67,095 uh, $67, in gross revenue. And then this year uh, we were up 22% um, and we did $81,675 in gross revenue. So uh, really just impressive that the fields are getting used as much as they possibly can um, to good clients. And uh, the other added benefit to this is we get a lot of feedback from surrounding towns and people that come in for these tournaments and practices and whatnot that uh, our field complexes are, are just uh, at the, the top of the, the game for, for the entire area. Uh, and we have much more to do in that area. So um, we're very pleased. And uh, again, all credit goes to Bobby when it comes to running the Enterprise Zone. Uh, he's done a, a fabulous job over the last couple of years. Um, the second piece that, that we run at the Athletic Foundation is the collection of the, of the player usage fees or the various uh, youth and recreation organizations in town. Um, if you recall back in, I guess, well, the spring of 2020, it's basically the spring in the fall sports that we collect the $25 player use fee uh, from each of the organizations. And um, as it's written in the MOU, 50% uh, of these fees go to the player, I'm sorry, to the turf enhancement account and 50%, I'm sorry, 50% of the fees go to the enhancements account and 50% of the fees go to the turf replacement account. So we keep two 
um, basically endowment type uh, accounts at the community foundation, one for turf replacement and one for enhancements or shiny new toys. Um, this year, uh, between the fall and the spring, we collected $93,825 from those player use fees. That's inclusive of one outstanding fee. Um, I'm sorry, one outstanding invoice from we have from the fall, which is from uh, recreation uh, flag football. And I would just make a note here that we've had some trouble uh, collecting from, from the rec department, uh, both in their spring program with the men's softball league and then this past uh, fall for the flag football league. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can smooth that out and get it collected on a more timely basis because obviously that season's been over for a couple of months now and yet we still have a, an outstanding invoice. So uh, hopefully we can get that that cleaned up and, and smoothed over uh, in, a, in a quick and easy way. Um, the last thing I would do is I, I don't have a full update on our master plan, but we are in the middle of the capital campaign. And I, I would just give you a brief update that uh, we've had a lot of momentum I think we, we had a lot of momentum through the spring. Um, and then when we had to cancel our big fundraising event with Field Fest back in the fall, we, we slipped a little bit in terms of the fundraising that we had a goal for 2021. We still did really well in spite of all of this. And, um, and the other reason we, we kind of slowed a little bit in the fall is that our master plan, as we, we talked about putting shovels in the ground for the two things that are at the top of our list, which are an enhancement to Dunning Stadium, uh, the press box and the entrance to Dunning Stadium and a new varsity baseball complex. Uh, as we talked to our master planning committee and with Tiger and, and others in town, uh, it was just gonna be too hard to get all of the, uh, it was gonna be too hard to pull everything together and put a shovel in the ground in June or in late June of 2022, which was our initial goal. We'll still do a lot of planning. Um, we're working with Richter and Segan in order to have all that ready so that we can continue to fundraise and likely do something in the summer of 2023. Uh, potentially with baseball, we could do something earlier because they don't they wouldn't use the fields uh, in the late summer and, and then through the fall. Um, so as it stands right now, our enhancements account sits at a little over half a million dollars of, of monies that have been raised to date. Um, and uh, we have commitments that are well north of that as we run through our master plan and continue with our fundraising. So brief update for me, uh, a lot of momentum at the Athletic Foundation and happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks, well, Mike. Any questions? Yeah, uh, Neil, then Amy, yeah. Yeah, um, so it begs the question, uh, just delay payment from the town, I don't, I, I assume it's still a problem or you wouldn't be bringing it up now. Is that your subtle way of saying this is really way too long? Uh, it, it has been a back and forth for quite a while and it would be helpful to, to not have to feel like a, a bill collector. Yes. Okay, so do you feel like you know the solution to making the system work? I mean, we have the money, you know. Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's our understanding as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, oh. What am I missing? I mean, the, the money should go to you guys. I mean, the way it works is you have to pay to be in these programs. And, and when you have to pay, you have to pay this fee. It's like before people get on the fields, the money ought to go to you guys because you shouldn't be playing unless you've signed up. And, and for 95% of the organizations, that's what happens. It, it's actually, you do need to get the roster. So we, we, okay. we don't bill for like the first month because it, you'll you have to sure. have all rosters. But but yes, at that point, um, we should we should get paid. How and, much are, are they in arrears? I mean, you gave us the total. Was it there, was well, thirty thousand the total? What you raised? How much is in arrears? Uh, uh, about nine thousand. No, it was ninety three thousand eight twenty five is the total for the spring and the fall, and the only outstanding one. I'm I'm guesstimating that the flag football program was around three hundred and sixty players at twenty five dollars a player. That's nine thousand okay. dollars, and that's that's roughly what it says on the website. So. How do we get these guys to get the money? Yeah, I don't get it. I don't there's been it. there's been multiple back and forths uh, between the recreation department and the athletic foundation in order to try to get that, and uh, so we're just bringing it up to the to the highest level to try to get it uh, resolved quickly. But aren't yeah. the rec department funds managed through our treasury department? Can we just pull them out? <laughs> yeah. What's the issue? In other words, Mike, cutting the chase. What is the issue with you getting paid? Uh, 
What are we missing, Michael? We we sent we sent something to Steve Banco and and he we we don't get a response or we get uh, a runaround on a lot of. Can things. we just CC it to Steve Banco and then somebody? Um, you know, the CFO or something like hey, that. Hey, Josh, Josh, could I just ask you to look into this and, or, you know, it could be something sure. that I uh, just find yeah. out what's going on. Yeah. And just get back to us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you, if you could forward me the, like the last email exchange that took place between you and Steve, then I sure. could try to expedite and, it. Andy Gordon, our treasurer handles it, but I will do that. Absolutely. Fine. Sure. Let, let's do that. Let, just get back to me after you find out what's going on. Yeah, yep. Josh, sure, I'll, I'll help you out with that tomorrow. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Michael, anything else? Not at this time. I'm, I think that in the next month or so, we'll have a, a, a bigger update on the master plan. Okay. Yeah, Amy, I, you had a question. I think yeah. Amy had a question. Yeah. yeah. Hey, just quick question. And this is awesome what you guys are doing. Um, for the fields rentals, I believe you said um, it was 81,000 gross. Is Correct. there a net number? Not yet because we haven't finalized our, the way the MOU reads is we, we take out our operating expenses and we're allowed to hold 50% back. So I don't have the net number yet because we haven't we haven't nailed down exactly what our, our operating expenses were for 2021. It's done on a calendar year basis. Okay. If I'm it, if it, I it, I would it, say last year it was roughly twenty thousand dollars of operating expenses. Okay. So my guess is it'll be around sixty grand. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. It's great. Any yes, other thanks. questions? Yeah, yeah just, quick question. Uh, Tom, Tom. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So, so Michael, just when you say your operating expenses, if you could just chat quickly, just for everybody's benefit. So, to the extent that there's increased usage and there's a greater number of events at the facilities, you, you have some operating Ooh. expenses. But then, the various departments that run these uh, facilities for the town, they themselves, is that right? They also incur greater expenses because, because we all see that kind of flow through to parks and maybe a little bit to Tiger and whatnot. I'm just wondering how that has all worked well. Have you gotten the services you've, you've wanted and all that? And, uh, oh, we've absolutely gotten all the, yes. I mean, they, it, it's, um, the, the, they've been very helpful and, and when right. we run the enterprise and, and Bobby's worked well with, with Tiger, John, Steve, uh, when he runs his programs in the summer, he do, they do a great job helping us out. Right. right. But so, just, just so everyone knows, so they, they have their own operating expenses, but there's other you know, services that the various departments are providing for the use of those facilities. And we'll all see those flow through those departments as well, right? Yes. For turning on the lights and, you know, that kind of stuff. That yeah. You most would have no that, ability to do that, right? That's right. Most of, most of those, most of the activities are really, like when we have operating expenses, when we run a tournament, when we bring in um, bathrooms and things like that, that also, that all comes to the, to the athletic foundation. But general maintenance of the fields over the summer, and and yeah. if they use the lights at night, yes, that's yeah. that's a that's through the town budget. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. I had two questions. One is, um, do we know? So I saw that we have about ten acres of synthetic fields right now in New Canaan. Do we know how that compares to Darien and Wilton and other towns that we compete with? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I would say intuitively, I know that we're less than Darien and far less than Greenwich and probably more than, than Wilton. But I don't okay. have the exact number off the top of my head. So is it, I, cause I'm wondering if, um, if a town like Wilton says, well, you know, these other towns have more synthetic fields than we do. Is that a motivation for them to get synthetic fields? And then so, like, does the whole region in 10 years time, do we have double the synthetic fields that we have now? I can tell you just again, intuitively and, and somewhat anecdotally, even with all of the, and, and I've been involved in a number of these discussions, even with all the synthetic fields that we have, there is uh, a scarcity and, and the amount of volume that, that wants to get on the turf um, between all the youth programs and all the high school programs um, you'd think, you know, we, we basically did more than double the turf size when we built these back in 2016, and yet uh, they're busting at the seams in terms of usage. And all I get is, is more and more requests to have uh, additional turf space because there's just, uh, there's such a, a need for it. And my second question was, um, do you know what the materials are that are used to make these fields? 
Uh, I do. It's uh, what what we call virgin turf, or uh, I forget the. I used to know this stuff off the top of my head. I was a, a turf expert when we were going through it. But uh, I would tell you it's virgin rubber. So it's not recycled tires. It's it's rubber that's manufactured specifically for the turf fields and has never been used for anything before. And it's the and oh EPDM. That's the that's right. the I don't know what EPDM stands for, but um, it is the the safest and the most economically and environmentally friendly surface you can use uh, for that type of synthetic surface. And the other ones that people use are, are coconut and that's been that's been proven to have a whole bunch of problems, especially in the Northeast, because it freezes, it lifts and floats when it rains. Um, so we went through all this back in 2016 when we had a turf expert uh, consultant actually help us when we were uh, re re redoing all the fields. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from Michael? Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Okay, appreciate it. Very good. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Okay, over to uh, I think Patty for the town players. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to talk to you and meet with you in person, hopefully uh, at the theater at some point. I'm going to share my screen, and um, I think it will help help the, the story along since I'm not sure how recently any of you have had the opportunity to visit the Powerhouse Theater in Waveney. Trisha, I see two um, entries for you. So I've made both co-hosts so that you can share your screen. I'm not sure which one is your. Yeah, one is Joel. He's, uh, my husband's watching from the, okay. uh, my other, my other account we're borrowing from the beautification link, so. Okay, all right, yeah. so you should but be thank good. you, thank you very much. All right, so let's see how this goes. All right, so I trust you can see my screen now? Yep. Yeah. yep. Okay, excellent. And um, I'll just point out that several of the board members are joining me from the town players. So Deborah Burke, our president is on. Deborah, you could do a little wave, thank you. And Joel Reynolds, who's also my husband, he's on as well. So. Uh, and then there's uh, Bill Shields, Kathy Davidson, Sheila Toner, and I might be leaving somebody else. And um, I'm hoping Rich Kompanik will join. He's our treasurer. Um, so he, he also lives in town. Um, he's had a conflict that he was going to try to get out of. All right, so the town players of New Canaan. Um, I'm going to give you a little story here and then go through our uh, request to the town and just point out that this is the first of the three meetings that we're going we were invited to present uh, first to the board of finance then the selectmen and the town council next week so again we thank you for this opportunity uh, so a little bit about the powerhouse theater or as it was originally named the powerhouse performing arts center what you see in the top left here is a picture that we have from 1897 of the original powerhouse that was located in the part of the park now where the powerhouse theater and the carriage barn art center exist today and the bottom picture shows what we describe as the campus of the powerhouse performing arts center with the theater on the left the annex in the middle and then on the right is the potting shed which I think you're all aware of is currently unused and being um, requested to be renovated. Right. So the town players of New Canaan began as an all volunteer community theater in 1946. So we're now in our 75th season, contiguous season. In 1957, we got non-exempt tax status as a 501c3. And until 1983, when the Powerhouse Theater was opened, they performed around town, wherever they could, in the middle school, the high school, in the Bickley's barn several times, and a couple other community um, homes. But at the time, the town, the Lions Club, and the original town players group approached the town to ask if we could convert the powerhouse into our theater. So that's what we have today. And it was a beginning of a 
40 year relationship, a public private partnership that has been very, very successful. Um, and I think you all know that the town maintains the outside of the building and the town players has maintained the inside of the building. We've been remiss, I think, in not reporting back to the town in any way in we'd like to come back every year and just give a brief update. Um, but one of the numbers you might find interesting is that in recent years, the town players spends about 40,000, 40 to $45,000 a year on utilities, maintenance, um, everything that needs to happen to run the theater without putting on a production. So that's our cost that you've not had to incur by having the building be actively used. So again, we're, we're thankful for having this home and we'll give you a little bit more idea about what goes on inside the theater. Um, in 1985, the town players asked the town if we could build an annex to host or host our costume and props. And again, in the bottom part of the picture, that's the building that looks like a modified Tudor with the long roof line in the middle. So that's our costume and prop annex. And at the time in 1985, the town players also added, asked, requested, and got approval from the town to enclose what is currently a cement courtyard to enclose that and add that to our lobby. So that was agreed, but the work hasn't been, hadn't been done. So we'd like to say it's postponed until now. We'd like to you know, go ahead and enclose that patio. So again, we've had 48 seasons in the powerhouse theater. So that's a little bit of history. And this is going to be our ask to the town. So one, again, we'd like to reconfirm that 1985 agreement that we could enclose the patio that you see here in the photo on the right. So all of that area would be enclosed and I'll show you a little bit more about what the new design looks like. The second ask that we have is that the potting shed, which was destined to become public restrooms, that that be added to our campus so that we can expand our capacity for new theater arts programs. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we think, pardon my pun and pun intended, it would be a waste to use the potting shed for waste. Um, but that's our second request. And the third request to the town, and we'll come to that towards the end of my little update, is that the town contributes to project, the funding of this project that we're talking about for renovating the potting shed into a shed theater. And the enclosure that we're talking about for the expanding the lobby. So we are going to come back and ask and I'll, I'll do a footnote at this point that in 1983 and 1985 when this work was originally done to the building, the town really had no involvement in the, the design or the building or even the expansion to the annex except to make the approval that we could use the building. So the town players was required to actually initiate a contract with any architects or any builders and to manage all of the work. The town did not own the contracts. That is very different now. So in fact, in 1983 and 85, a lot of the work, the build work that was done, especially on the annex, was done by volunteer time or in-kind donations from local builders which greatly reduced the overall cost to the, the town players at the time. So now any building work, as we've been working very closely with Tigerman and Bill Osman, have been great partners in this planning this project out. We understand that the town has to own the contract and all the work needs to be done um, with prevailing wages. So I'll just point that out because it's, it's part of why we're asking the town to contribute to the project. Okay, so just um, a couple of pages here to give you an idea about the, the town players and what we've been doing. So pre-pandemic, you would have about five main stage productions every year. We've got some nice photos of the great work that um, Joel, Deborah, and I, and those on the, the call with us have all been involved in over the last several years. 
Um, you can see we do wonderful sets, if I do say so. The acting's been great. The plays have been fun. Uh, the last show that we did pre-pandemic was Rocket Girl. I hope most of you saw it. It was really a tremendous success. Um, and it really woke up for me. I did the lighting for all of these shows. It really woke up for me the need to have community outreach. So with Rocket Girl, we did a production on a Friday afternoon for students from um, a charter school in Bridgeport, St. A's in town, and St. Luke's in town. We had the playwright come, and we spoke. he spoke at the library. He spoke at country school to their entire fifth grade class. Um, we just, it was a great, great experience. So we also pride ourselves on having what we consider to be affordable theater for the community. Our adult tickets are $30, students and seniors are 25. Over th about 3,000 people would come to the theater, visit the theater, participate in our productions um, on an annual basis. 50% or more come from New Canaan as residents. We know that from ticket sales in our 06840 zip code. And about 90% <coughs> were from Connecticut and others just are visiting or from New York. We have 20% are students and 40% are seniors. So pretty wide mix in terms of the audience. Um, we also, as an all volunteer theater, we sat down and we added up the time that we all spend across everybody to make these shows happen. And it's over 17,000 hours annually. It's, it's a lot. And for any one show, there's at least 30 people that touch or are involved with it from marketing and uh, box office, the actors, all of the set design, build, painting, prep, costumes, props. It's just, it's a lot of, a lot of work, but a lot of volunteers. And we're, we're proud of that. We've got a very strong um, community. I'll also mention that one of the key aspects of our theater has been to have programs to support education of the arts, of theater arts. And in particular, we had a very active student stage workshop um, from, that were run by a mother and then her daughter. And they kind of um, retired because one I mean, it was time and um, the daughter started raising a family. So they did a great job and I know uh, many of the families in town participated in that program that was at least 30 years strong. But between the pandemic and everything else, we kind of paused. And we realized that that's one of the things that we need to focus on as we reopen the theater. Um, so we'll talk more about that and what we're doing there. Um, so the pandemic impact. Well, we regrouped. Uh, Rocket Girl closed March 8th. The city and most of the world shut down, I think, on the 13th. And we got together, uh, Deborah, Joel, and I, and a few of the other members, and said, how do we not stop what we're doing? Because we didn't want to be, although we had to be closed to live audiences, we wanted to keep going. So we streamed over six different productions, including, you can see pictures of what we did from a radio show to one-act plays, to a play with a husband and wife, The Outgoing Tide, that was done in um, September. Actually, I don't think I have the date right there. But we were, yeah, it was. It was in September 2020. So we had acts and theater on our stage pretty much continually, even though there were only three of us in this theater, um, behind a bunch of iPhones that were recording and streaming live. I mean, we did a holiday show with one man uh, who did a great job of a reading of The Night Before Christmas, which is out and available on our website. It's a nice little our Christmas card to our, our audience. But financially, there was definitely an impact. So our audience was down 85%. Our earned income was down 80%. Individual donations was down 50%. And it's worth noting that as an all-volunteer organization in the arts, we were not eligible for any of the state or federal PPE COVID relief funds. So it was one of the 
things that we said to you should we hire somebody that so that we could be eligible which we obviously didn't do so that all contributed to us running lean and mean um, but definitely was a challenge but we were really proud of being able to keep the entertainment going for our community so how are we doing now as we look towards recovery from the pandemic well we've opened our 75th season to a live theater with on golden pond as our first main stage theater production which you can see in the, the right there we have a full set of programs in our main stage and we're hoping that even with Omicron, we'll be able to keep them as live with live audiences. We did limit the number of people in our audience to 50% just to try to make people more confident in having a little bit of distance between them. We also required proof of vaccination to come into the theater and everybody except for the cast members were masked. Our cast members were all vaccinated before we came back live because you're seeing them on stage there without masks. Um, the other thing that we've done is even in this time, we've doubled down on expanding our programs, which includes, as I'm featuring at the bottom, programs that are being staged on the powerhouse stage by the Open Arts Alliance, which has been running for eight years very successfully out of Greenwich, but they don't have a stage and we have a wonderful stage. So they've come in and rented the stage for their youth program. And in working with them, we realized that this group might be the answer or help us provide the answer to what we do for a student to replace our what was our student workshop. And we're doing hosting them in um, April this year with a musical Rogers and Hammerstein Cinderella. We had reached out to um, families in New Canaan and we had 12 people from kids from New Canaan audition and they're going to participate. They're actually going to have three different casts because they had so many students overall respond. So we're looking forward to that and that will be open to the public. Um, we also have Mr. Hastings, who's a very popular teacher before he um, left country school and run improv classes with kids this summer and fall. And that's been great. So I know that's brought additional new interest in the theater, particularly with some of our new residents in town and new families in town. And another uh, couple of musicians in town came to us and said, gee, we'd really love to do live music, acoustic music at the Powerhouse. So we've got a new program. We're starting Jam and Bread, live music at the Powerhouse. So we are seeing more interest in town. We know that we need to re-engage the community. We know we need to invest in programs, but that also means we need to invest in our facility. Because when you look at the facility itself, we've got a 115 seat theater, which we're not planning to change. It works really well the actual auditorium. Um, what we do have in limited space is our lobby. So the bottom left hand, if you haven't been in the theater, I'm encouraging you to contact us and visit. The lobby is a little over 200 square feet, 300 square feet. It's woefully too small, always was for 100 people coming into the theater, which is why we really want to add the enclosed the courtyard so that we can have a much better space. At the same time, we have one of the best community theaters in the state of Connecticut in terms of our backstage areas. So my husband's domain, which is the shop where all the sets get built. We've got wonderful dressing rooms on the second floor for men and women, or girls and boys. And we've got in the annex, as we talked about, a whole costume area, which is jam packed and a prop room, which is well stocked for whatever we might need. So we've got a really, really good facility. Everybody that comes in says, wow, this is wonderful. So what are we proposing? So here you can see we've got a wonderful model. And the model actually um, dates back to originally 1983, uh, the original part of the, the model that was shared with the town to say, here's what we want envision. And then the newer part, um, which was rebuilt by Rose and Carl Rothbart, our architects, 
he said, he helped us envision what this new space would look like. So what you can see here is the patio, which the smaller picture on the left shows the concrete cat patio, that being covered by this wonderful um, frame construction with a standing seam copper roof that would be such a welcoming entrance to the theater with a little outcrop, which is a nod over to the original turret, if, base of the turret, if you will, of the, uh, that's on the left side of the picture, so that we would have very welcoming space. And the bottom right of the picture shows the potting shed, which we would love to turn into a shed theater, which we would use as the centerpiece for our education programs and as a black box theater. So we think that'll be a um, really good addition. And then we would envision that the courtyard would be available for accessible to people and, and as our outdoor space as well, but it'd be more used for sitting in just general good public space. So this is another version looking at it from the parking lot that's opposite or between the powerhouse and the, the garden area as to you can see on the sidelines what the roof lines would look like. So I'm going to pause here because it's important to point out that you know, there's also plans for having public restrooms in this courtyard. And what we would ask the town is that as the town players takes on the potting shed for the shed theater, that the public restrooms be built as an addition to the annex, added on to the end of the annex in which case we would kind of close in that, cover that whole courtyard in a nice uh, balanced way. So that's what the physical plan is, and we believe that that would give us the adequate space we need to expand the programs we have. So I'm gonna close with the three, back to the three asks to summarize, that we reconfirm with the town the agreement that we, the town players had in 1985, to enclose the patio, that today we amend the agreement that we have with the town to add the potting shed to the campus of the Performing Arts Center for the powerhouse. And in terms of financially, all in for everything that we talked about for the, um, the improvements we've talked about, it would be with contingency about a million and a half dollars, including the landscaping. And we're asking the town to contribute 50% of that and the town players would raise and donate the remaining 50% at 750. I will add here that at this point, we have committed funding of 275,000. We have written and submitted capital grant requests for an additional 80,000 from three different organizations, including the community foundation in town, which we hope to hear over the next few months on those, that would bring us to about 350, you know, so well on our way halfway to where we would want to be in this case. So that's our ask to the town as we meet with each of the groups. And uh, I thank you for your consideration. And I'm glad to answer any questions and invite you to come see the theater. So thank you for that. That was uh, actually excellent and a great vision for, I'll call it the Powerhouse Theater Campus, as you've described it, just to have it laid out the way you did. Can I ask though, can you go out of screen share? Because it's hard for us to see all the people on the screen and, and raise their hands. If, uh, Absolutely. So let yeah, me... you understand. I, I know people will have questions and it's hard to, it's my least favorite thing about Zoom. So um, there we go if we can go back to that. So uh, I guess I'll open it up to questions. Questions for, and, and then I do, I'm gonna come back to the process because you're gonna meet with town council, you're gonna meet with select um, the board and then you're going to have it in your budget request, I guess. That's what, that's what will be for a process. For, right, okay. and, and I should mention that Tucker have, has given you a um, PDF version of the information that I shared with you today. So it should be on your yeah, top. We have it. We do. We all have it. Okay. Okay. Questions. Thank you. That was great. Any questions? 
points of clarification. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I, I have um, some questions. Um, some are numbers questions, some are just understanding uh, the town players and uh, the process. Just from a numbers perspective, really quickly, I think, and I don't have it up right now, I think you had a $200,000 line item for uh, changing the potting shed into a black box theater. Is that just what you're expecting to do for the interior? Or is that assuming yeah. our yeah. expense? And I mean, you know, currently it's stone and looks stucco now, and roofs are expensive. So, I, just that, uh, I'm, I'm I'm curious about that. Yes. Okay. So that we, what we would expect the town to complete is the exterior renovation and putting a floor in, and then what we need to do. And Tiger, you can jump in. What we need to do is come in and outfit it with, uh, for example, a lighting grid so that we can use it as a performance space. Okay, so is the $200,000 number uh, both of those expenses or is it just part of it? Just the town players portion. Okay, so actually on top of that ask is the assumption that we would take on the expense of renovating the interior and putting the floor on and fixing the roof. Right, so that's not a real full all in cost if you were to try to take this over for a um, smaller theater space. Is that correct? So, Tiger, you want to answer that? Do you want me? Uh, sure. Um, in essence, yes, Amy, you're right. There's a, about a hundred to hundred and ten thousand dollars of work that the town would have to do on the exterior, um, the roof, the walls on the outside, repointing, and then replacing or uh, reinstalling the floor itself. So the town's portion of that is 110. The interesting thing about that is that we had asked for 250 in our budget last year. Um, it was in this coming fiscal year. Last year, you just gave us design money for, uh, for the potting shed bathroom itself. Um, subsequent to that, this discussion occurred um, since we were, it was beneficial that we had the Rothbart's as our architect and the town players architect so that they could look at the entire campus as a whole. And the thought came in of actually installing bathrooms, um, as Patricia mentioned, um, as an adjunct to the uh, uh, to the prop area. And that comes in at about $150,000. So 110 and 150 gets us to 250, 260. So we're still within what our initial ask was for the town to get the bathrooms and we still renovate the potting shed and then allow it to be used for uh, a better, uh, you know, a better type of uh, service. Okay. Or, or alternatively, we could get our bathrooms put in at a lower price point if we didn't take on this. Additional Possibly. Correct? Possibly. I don't, the, the estimate that we had from the Rothbards at the time was, was 235 with contingency to give me the 250. Um, so it's, that's a possibility. I, I, I won't say it's a, it's a, it's a definite, but. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm having a little trouble following those, those numbers, but we can, this is preliminary, so that's fine. So, um, and Patricia, just in terms of the, the town theater, uh, the, the town players and the organization, um, how many active members are there? I tried to look and see the board <coughs> who are the board members, where are they? I, I know you and your husband are. Um, like how many how many people are uh, yeah, actively involved in it? And when you give us a 3000 number for people, is that distinct people coming to the theater or it might be somebody who comes to a number of programs a year, you know? Do you know? So in terms of the board members, we have I believe 12 board members, plus or minus. Kathy's shaking her head yes, thank you. So we have 12 board members. Um, I believe four of us at this point live in New Canaan, including Bill Shields, who's on the, the phone with us, Joel, myself, and Rich Kompanik, our treasurer. The others are from surrounding communities, right? And the, the board members changed here and there. Um, I think you all know Tom Butterworth, who Tom, I see you on. He's been a past board member. Bob Pern has been a past board member. Dick Stewart was a recent board member. So um, Rich Townsend was a board member. So we, 
you know, it comes and goes, right? And that's the, the idea of community theater, that you have people involved over time. Um, yeah, Kit Watson is also on the board. Uh, I think you maybe all know him. Uh, he was in the Gridiron Show here this last year with Dave Hunt, for Dave Hunt. Uh, so it, it varies. In terms of the people who come, we are counting number of tickets sold to get to the 3,000. So yes, it could be that somebody comes to three shows, and in that case, yes, it might be counted a couple of times. But nonetheless, we're, we're pretty proud of having you know, pretty much sold out shows pre-pandemic and um, very, very good supporters. And, and in um, the discussion of it, it trying to uh, expand the educational component, so there was a strong program. People did it for a long time. And so you, what you're talking about is rebuilding that right now? Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And, um, and Tiger, this I would talk about at one point, if I looked at the plans, it looks like we have two sets of ADA bathrooms within steps of each other. Now, I know one is embedded within the theater exactly but but then i mean literally you know i don't know how far I, I didn't get a chance to go down but very nearby are a whole nother set of ada bathrooms and you know it just seems like that that may perhaps be redundant and maybe there's some sort of clever way of looking at that that it, we that's just we had look at, you're you're correct we had looked at that but the uh um because the original plans originally were just that we were going to put some uh uh accessible bathrooms in the powerhouse itself, but that wound up um, reducing the lobby further. And then they had to vacate their office space in order to um, accommodate the bathrooms and put their office space upstairs. Uh, so then at that point, we looked at possibly using the potting shed for their office space and then things started moving around. So you are correct. The difficulty is that the bathrooms are set deep into the theater. So you'd have to leave the theater open all the time to allow people access in and they'd have access to every portion of the theater which we don't want um we have accessible bathrooms at the carriage barn that we just installed as part of their renovation so they're close by as well so you know the proximity while it, you know it can be considered problematic there's no real easy workaround uh to it um you know they they the um the initial asks rose separately right so we had to we had to make the the powerhouse theater ADA accessible. And then subsequent to that discussion was putting in outside bathrooms because of all the work that the Conservancy had started doing and the increased use of the of the parks because of the pandemic. Um, and now we think it's probably going to be a constant. Um, so they rose separately and now we're trying to meld the two together into a much more cohesive uh, campus or a framework, so to speak. Okay. And, and I, I would add that, you know, it's, so as we, we talked about, one of the things we, you know, we're responsible for maintaining the inside of the theater. So um, the thought of, you know, maintaining public restrooms, uh, probably not something that we would want to take on. And as Tiger said, they are going to be, the, the restrooms are inside the theater. You really wouldn't want to leave that building open to the public. No, and, and there's no option to, um to address the need for ADA bathrooms by having the uh, facility right nearby, considering how small the space is and, and the level of demand. And I know there's a lot of ADA. Anyways, this could be a later discussion, but it, it seems very redundant to me um, to have um, those expenses. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, so I guess one thing I, I mean, maybe it's not a fair analogy, but it'd be like saying, you know, we all have bathrooms in our homes, and as people are walking by their house, your house, that they've got the ability to come in and use your restroom. I, I mean, oh, no, no, I wasn't. I wasn't saying necessarily to embed the public bathrooms into the theater, but whether the public bathrooms very close to the theater might be able to provide appropriate services for people who would use it. That I wasn't in any oh, way. Well, but, bathrooms. But then, it's just a thought because it just it's right. very expensive and probably utilization is not enormous so but, yeah so i just make one other comment on that and we can go on but you got to think about somebody and you know our mothers who both are would fit well into being users of those bathrooms 
Um, we want to make them as convenient as possible when they come to the theater. Right, so it's really important that they are very accessible to the, the theater, the auditorium. Anyway, I think we talked two, about that. Two quick follow-up questions from me, from my point of view. One is um, the ARPA money. What's yes. the status of, was there money already assigned for this, for some of this, none of this? Or this is part of, this is like a, a secondary ask. What, what's the reference to ARPA? There was there was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of ARPA funds committed to uh, accessible bathrooms right. in this vicinity, either in the yeah. potting shed or in the addition. Um, the, the council was the only one that wanted to have additional clarity and committed the funds, but did not commit the okay. facility at yet as of yet. So they haven't committed whether it's the potting shed or an addition. They wanted additional um, information, but they did commit to the to the funding. And, and as you thought through the 750 from the town, did you include that 250? I, I did not. I did not. So the, the numbers, unfortunately, uh, the amounts are very close. So the 250 that Tiger's talking about is specifically to address the town requirement for the public ADA restrooms and yep. maintaining and, and renovating the potting shed. The additional funding that I'm asking for is additional to that separate because it's for the theater is the 750,000 which I'm not presupposing the source of that funding so whether the town sees That's fit right. to That's fund part or all of it from ARPA or budget okay. I'm not okay. presupposing but it's separate. okay no that helps me that I, I, I that I understand okay and then who the potting shed ownership it's owned by the town right today tiger Correct. And so I'm not sure if I'm understanding, are you just asking us to give that to the powerhouse theater 501 C what's your, what, when you uh, say not, not give, but let us use it the same way that you let us use. Okay. Your tenants. We are tenants. We have a landlord tenant relationship right. okay. in our public private partnership. So it would be amending our current agreement from 1983 that says the town allows the town players to make use of the space where we maintain the interior and the town maintains Perfect. the exterior. Okay. So and we then be taking on an additional building for the town, yet yet another building oh, that we're in charge of maintaining. In essence, yes, it's an additional 400 square feet of uh, roof line or uh, 400 square feet of roof you know, or, or area. Um, well, in mechanicals too, Tiger, right? We're, we're in charge of keeping the mechanicals up and everything, right? In the water. <clears throat> In our buildings, right? We would be for sure. In this bath, it, for this case, yeah, for the bathrooms, we would be. We would be doing it whether it was in the potting shed or elsewhere. Um, if the potting shed itself, we would be responsible for the exterior as we are for yeah. the carriage barn and for the powerhouse themselves. We don't really do much on the inside. They take care of their utilities yeah. and then any small maintenance on the inside. We get into uh, larger maintenance requirements. Nothing, uh, nothing of a day-to-day -day nature. No, okay, no, no, no. We supply other utilities. We we have the we put the HVAC in and the electric. You know, we, that's that's part of us owning the building, and you know, paying the electric bills and keeping it painted is their part, right? Right. The Lord, yes. The uh, uh, you know, you would. It's similar to any other landlord tenant relationship. Um, you know, it. Um, so yes, we have the larger items. We don't have any of the small items. Or the day-to-day okay. -day right. work, but, but for the shed theater, I would expect that you'd bring, for example, power to the building, and then we would take on everything else inside to make it work for a theater. For example. Well, that's heat. That that's heat and AC. Are, are you sure? That's okay. All right. Well, TBD maybe. And then my last question: Who's the liaison on this? Is that Michael? Is that you or Tom um, in Park and Rec or any of these other areas? Nobody. I'm I'm with uh, Park and Rec with um, Tom and Michael. You're in yeah. I'm I'm on yeah, but but I, I don't know. think any of us have been pulled into it at this. Okay. Point. Could 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 one of you volunteer to um, be that liaison on this item since it's a significant amount of, of a request right now to get our head wrapped around what it would be, where might that money come from, and and once we get the feedback from the board of selectmen and town council, if it's going to proceed, how we would make that proceed and we're going to need we're going to need a little some eyes on this. 
So you don't have to tell me now, but I think I think the answer for you, Patricia, would be we would have someone be designated. Judy, are you raising your hand or? I, I have a comment and a couple of questions. Uh, I'm not clear on the source of revenues here. I mean, is the Arts Alliance, are these towns, are these groups going to pay you to use these buildings for their performances? They and do. Are, they, they, do. They, 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 rent. they rent, essentially are renting the theater when they come in. Yes. So it helps in our income. I'm not clear here. It just says sources, earned income, donations. It doesn't say who's who's paying what. Like how much can you expect from an outside organization who's going to use your theater? Any any town. Right. Any so so our you know we we do as does the carriage barn. We do charge a rental fee. Um, the for programs that we are you know, sponsoring, working with nonprofits, you know, we, we kind of ne negotiate based on the joint value that we get. But we are consistent because we work very closely with the carriage barn. We're consistent in our, our rates for that. And I'd be glad to share any of that information with you as we you know, get into this more closely. And also, uh, the note I sent you, are you all up to other town groups? I mean, are we going to be able to have space or meetings or a uh, event in any component of this? And if so, I mean, that that's a big draw if that were to happen. I just wonder if you can we, we have had and continue to have good partnerships. So for example, the um, Laura Hoskins, many of you know in town, she um, is brings her group in. They were here in, in December with a Christmas carol reading. Um, they're going to do another performance in the theater in January. So somebody, Deborah, could help me with her name, the name of her organization. Um, performing, isn't it performing? The studio. Yeah. The studio. Yeah. So <laughs> they, they've come and we've done joint events with the Carriage Barn Art Center where they will host a cocktail hour and then they'll come over, the um, audience members would come over and see a performance. We did that in October, which worked out really well. So we definitely, in what we're doing, we're realizing the need to do this kind of community outreach and have it be more inclusive with other, um, I'd like to think nonprofits, right? I think that's important that we were supporting that because it, it is a, a good facility and a good asset for the town. But we are, honestly, we are limited in, in available time because putting on a main stage production, we're often you know, working on building a set two or three weeks before a, um, we, we go live with a show. So it's actually a pretty busy schedule right now. But, but so yes, Patricia, absolutely. we're going we're gonna to need to move on. Unless there are any other questions, I do need someone to just work as a liaison. Again, not urgent, not today. You've got you've got your other meetings, but um, that would be our involvement next if the town council and the board of selectmen want to proceed and we get into the budget process. Okay, and I should mention we did present to the Parks and Rock in December, and they were supportive of the, the proposal. Okay, any other questions for the from the board of finance? This point, I think we're good. Thanks for thanks for walking Thank us through so that. So much for the time. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, let's move on to uh, Steve. You've got an update on the Waveney Park Conservancy. Great. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to try and share a screen as well. Uh, let's see here. I made you co-host, Steve. Thank you. Uh, it, it seems to it seems to perfect. work. Yep, perfect. Job. Um, Thank you. Uh, let's see how I get this thing there. Um, okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, kind of update you on some of our activities, and uh, we will be making a budget request this evening. Um, but I thought what I would begin with is just to share a little bit of context uh, about the park and about the genesis of Waveney Park Conservancy um, to sort of uh, get the conversation going. Um, 
I don't think it comes as a surprise to any of you that Waveney Park is one of the most heavily used parks in New Canaan. And in fact, it's probably one of the most heavily used parks in uh, Southern Connecticut with uh, thousands of visitors coming to the park weekly. Um, historically, prior to our founding, the town of New Canaan dedicated relatively few resources uh, to the park and relatively little attention to the upkeep and improvement of Waveney. The basic maintenance was taken care of, but uh, no one was really out there searching for improvement opportunities and certain uh, maintenance issues were sort of festering and that resulted in considerable deferred maintenance uh, building up. And partly in response to that, uh, a number of town officials and concerned citizens, citizens came up with the idea to form the Waveney Park Conservancy in 2015 as a mechanism to focus uh, more attention on the care and maintenance and improvement of Waveney. And it's basically the mission of the Conservancy to act as an advocate for the parklands of Waveney, uh, identify capital improvement and critical maintenance projects within the park, and ultimately help fund and execute these projects in partnership with the town of New Canaan. And since our founding, the Conservancy either independently or with funding collaboration from the town or the Garden Club, who's partners, partnered with us on a number of occasions, uh, has completed numerous landscaping and maintenance projects. And I'll go over some of those in just a moment. Uh, Waveney Park Conservancy has raised about 2.5 million toward the revitalization of Waveney uh, since our founding. And to date, we've employed 1.3 million on various projects. Uh, this next slide, and I apologize, I hope you can all read this. Um, it, it's occurring to me right now that the type in the table is pretty small. Uh, but this next slide uh, provides a snapshot of the projects that we've undertaken, some of the maintenance initiatives that we have uh, going on. And I would also say that um, it, it shows the contribution we've made towards those projects and the town's contribution. Um, I've had some difficulty getting all of the figures uh, that the town has contributed. So it's possible that the town side is off uh, somewhat, but I think this is generally in the ballpark. Um, we've done some work in uh, the woodlands of uh, Waveney. Um, one of the largest projects we've undertaken is what's now called Jenny and Meadow. That was the former cornfield in the center of Waveney Park that uh, uh, prior to starting work on it had been used more or less as sort of a dumping ground for concrete and asphalt uh, by the town in the middle of the park. Uh, and we are, I would say, a good way along in completing uh, that project. If you've been down there, it's a beautiful meadow, but it still has uh, a ways to go in terms of growing in. And we've had some setbacks uh, due to drought, deer damage and that sort of thing, uh, which we are in the process of remediating. Um, we've also restored Anderson Pond, which was filling in and was in danger of becoming uh, uh, basically wetlands, in which case we would not have been able to touch it. Uh, the town joined with us on that project and any of you who've been down to the park, I think can now look down from the mansion and see sort of a beautiful vista, uh, not only of the pond, but of the plantings around the pond. Um, we've done some work uh, which continues with the assistance of the town on uh, the various walking trails along the South Avenue entrance and up that, uh, that way back to the mansion. Um, so quite a large amount of money have been put into the trail network, which has been very well received by uh, runners and walkers. Uh, we partnered with the Garden Club to restore the Parterre Garden, which is the formal garden uh, to the left of the mansion house. And then we're currently in the process of re-landscaping uh, the forecourt of the house um, we have a little more uh, work to do on that, but are hopeful that it will be completed by this spring. Uh, we've also installed some signage 
Uh, the, the Peony Walk project was ultimately uh, uh, put on hold, but we did some planning around that. And then as far as maintenance projects that are ongoing, uh, we've installed uh, dog waste stations throughout the park, uh, which have been well received. Uh, Jenny and Meadow uh, has recurring maintenance needs. Uh, we anticipate uh, probably doing another up to $30,000 of maintenance on the Meadow uh, this coming year. Um, Around the pond itself, we've installed uh, approximately $60,000 worth of new uh, plantings. Those will require some maintenance, um, not only in terms of, of weeding uh, around the beds and within the beds, but also uh, doing some uh, deer repellent spraying uh, during the winter months. Um, we've had a successful program um, uh, with interns in the park uh, most summers. They've helped out on a number of projects, uh, clearing invasive species, uh, clearing debris. Uh, this past summer, uh, working with uh, Greg Falacci on some of the walls. Um, and we periodically will assist with just more minor things like doing the window boxes uh, uh, in the Waveney House, uh, et cetera. The town, as I think you're well aware, has a, a routine line item in the budget to take care of the walls sort of around the perimeter of Waveney and some of the interior walls, um, and they're primarily responsible for that. Um, so again, uh, those are some of the projects that we've undertaken to date. Um, and I think what's also interesting about this slide, just to point out, is that while the town has certainly made a meaningful contribution to uh, a number of the major improvement projects at Waveney, the fact of the matter is, is that the Waveney Park Conservancy and our patrons and major benefactors have really done the majority of the heavy lifting as far as the funding of these projects. And one of the things we're going to be asking for tonight is to try to uh, create a little bit more equity between uh, the funding contribution that we make and the funding contribution that the town makes. Uh, we've learned a number of things in the past uh, six years and some things have, have uh, become, uh, I would say, more obvious to us. And, and the first uh, point here is that uh, Waveney Park is well regarded by town residents and we've had considerable fundraising success and we anticipate that that success will continue. Um, to put it in a little bit of perspective, we uh, over the past five years or so have raised on average about 380,000 a year. Um, and we would expect that that level of uh, funding from private patrons to continue. In fact, we would expect it to increase because we're in the process of hiring an executive director and one of their primary functions, functions is going to be to focus on development. But that being said, when we look at our master plan, which I'll talk to you in a little more detail in a moment, and when we look at some of the ongoing maintenance needs that uh, are going to have to be addressed within the park, uh, we think that it's very likely that the costs of those um, projects uh, will exceed our fundraising capacity. And so again, uh, knowing that the town is going to be a reliable financial partner with us uh, will be very helpful. Um, again, this is something that I think goes without saying, but town residents value Waveney very, very highly. And this became extremely evident during COVID times. And all you had to do is walk into the park and talk with uh, any number of users and you would hear superlatives like it's a crown jewel, it's a godsend, it's a critical sanctuary, uh, it's where I come to get solace, you name it. But people uh, value uh, what Waveney has to offer extremely, extremely highly. And that cuts across all age groups, uh, all different kinds of people. Uh, but despite the heavy usage and despite the extraordinary value that town residents place on Waveney, the fact is that town funding for Waveney in comparison to other town recreational assets, such as the athletic fields, playgrounds, library, 
Bristow Sanctuary is extremely low. And in fact, Waveney really receives almost no dedicated funding from the town. When the, found when the town does provide funding, it tends to be on more of a discrete project by project basis. And another finding of ours over the past uh, five or six years has been that while we're grateful for the town financially partnering with us on a project by project basis, doing so in that manner uh, can be cumbersome, frequently slows things down, it's inefficient, and it leads to a degree of uncertainty due to the capital budgeting cycle. Um, and one last point is that private benefactors, especially some of our, uh, our largest benefactors, uh, have demonstrated and indicated a willingness to continue to give generously to support and improve Waveney. But they want to see the town have more skin in the game. And that point was actually just driven home to me a couple of weeks ago. I met with uh, Trip Killen, who's the executive director of, of the Genium Foundation, which again is the organization that has uh, provided a lion's share of the funding for redoing the meadow. And he offered uh, once again this year to uh, provide up to $110,000 of additional funding so that we can uh, complete uh, some of the work on the meadow and also to uh, support a portion of our executive director's uh, salary. But he said, look, it, we're happy to do this, but we want to make sure that the town is fully committed to upholding and taking care of this asset. We want to see it have skin in the game. So I think that's a, a important consideration. Um, the next slide is a summary of some of the items that are contained in our master plan. And all of you should have a copy of the master plan document as well as a, another sheet that gives uh, a sense of, it's basically a, a replication of this table, which gives a sense of what some of the estimated cost ranges are on these projects. But I'll just provide a little bit of background on the master plan. Uh, and that is that I guess in late 2020, we hired uh, Catherine Herman, who's a very well-respected uh, landscape architect uh, to help us develop a forward-looking five-year master plan uh, for the park. Um, and Catherine, in addition to not only being a terrific landscape designer, also has been uh, uh, a member, I think, of the Merritt Parkway uh, Conservancy. So she's very familiar with uh, uh, projects and uh, issues surrounding the Merritt Parkway. And that's important uh, for a reason I'm going to point out in a moment. But Catherine assembled this plan after uh, spending a great deal of time uh, with her staff in the park. Uh, her work was also informed by outreach that we did to a number of different constituencies in town, asking for their opinions on what types of projects uh, they think we should focus on over the upcoming uh, five years. And so the output of that plan was to identify essentially eight projects. Um, and they're listed here. Um, I'm not gonna go into great detail on, on uh, each of these, but that is contained in the master plan document, which you should have a copy of, and which by the way, was presented, uh, I think at some point last year by our former chairman to the board of finance, as well as to Parks and Rec and the selectmen. But, her plan envisions uh, further uh, landscaping and beautification of the South Avenue entrance. Uh, she's developed a plan to uh, plant the entrance drive uh, between the, the driveway coming up from South Avenue and the, the walkway with native species leading up to the mansion house. Uh, her plan envisions doing considerable work around the parking and utility areas uh, nearby the mansion house. Um, it considers a provision for doing landscaping, whereas we've done the forecourt, we feel that there's also uh, considerable room for improvement in the landscaping 
uh, on the back side of the home. And then there's also, and this was touched on a moment ago in the discussion about the powerhouse theater, um, there is considerable opportunity to do some landscaping uh, to improve some of the outbuildings, primarily around the powerhouse theater and the carriage house. Uh, her plan also envisions uh, coming up with new, potentially more interesting mow patterns uh, for the meadows and fields behind the home, and then also doing further improvements uh, to beautify the Lapham Road entrance. Uh, and then uh, one of the major projects that we discussed and that we got a lot of feedback uh, from park users on was what's listed here is the Woodlands Trails Sound Remediation Project. I'm gonna call it the Merritt Parkway Trail Project. But for those of you who are familiar with the uh, trail that abuts the Merritt Parkway, um, you'll know that sometimes the actual trails there uh, are somewhat more difficult to maintain. Uh, but one of the big issues that people mention again and again is that the trail has no buffer to the Merritt Parkway. You see the Merritt Parkway, you hear the Merritt Parkway, and indeed the sound from the Merritt Parkway infuses back into uh, the full extent of the park. And so uh, it, it's been suggested that a transformational project would be to uh, improve that trail and to install some form of buffers between that trail and between the park and the Merritt for both sight and sound attenuation. Now, Catherine is envisioning, envisioning in her plan uh, potentially very substantial buffers. And as you can see here, the, the cost estimate is very high. Um, I think there may be opportunities to do some attenuation at a significantly lower cost but the bottom line is that we probably won't know what our options are until we've done uh, considerably, considerably more uh, uh, research on this issue. We're going to need to do some engineering studies um, and other design work to come up with a set of options for how we can address some of the issues that people have brought up time and time again uh, regarding that trail. Um, so this leads me into, um, excuse me, I'm going backwards. This leads me into our budget request. And obviously to accomplish these projects, we would love to have um, visibility on uh, the town's commitment. And tonight we'd like to uh, request that in the 2023 to 2028 Parks Department capital budget, including a minimum of $300,000 uh, an annual dedicated and recurring allocations for Waveney Park improvements. And we are willing to uh, commit to contributing matching funds per annum of $250,000 per year towards capital projects. It may be that we have the capacity to do more than that. And we also anticipate having to fund approximately forty-five dollars to $50,000 each year in incremental maintenance to maintain uh, projects we're currently completing and projects that we will be completing in the future. Um, each individual project uh, that we undertake in the future uh, will have to be presented to appropriate town personnel and town bodies for approval. So that doesn't really change much from what we're doing right now, that we're not asking for simply a blank check without any checks and balances. Uh, recurring funding at the $300,000 per year level will, number one, enable us to accelerate completion of critical projects. Number two, it will help us streamline the approval processes and reduce the cycle times in launching new projects. It will help us reduce the funding burden uh, on Waveney Park Conservancy so that, so that in addition to doing capital projects, we also have other expenses. So this will help, help us meet some of those other expenses for both administration and maintenance. And then it will demonstrate uh, the town's commitment to patrons and key benefactors. Uh, 
And this next slide provides just a brief budget projection and cash reconciliation um, looking out over the next five years. And I would warn you that this is a uh, rough effort I would expect that uh, some of these numbers would change. I would expect that some of the priorities uh, implied here uh, may change uh, somewhat as well. But directionally, I think this is, this is, uh, is more or less correct. Um, and there are a couple things that I'll point out uh, just on this table, which is that, again, as we discussed earlier, we think that on average, we're going to be able to raise at least uh, $350,000 to $400,000 per annum from donations, grant revenues, uh, events. It may be higher than that. Um, we're grateful for the allocation of ARPA funds that was recently uh, made. And as you can see in our revenue line, uh, we're hoping for the $300,000 per annum that uh, I mentioned a moment ago. And if uh, all of those sources come about, we would anticipate over the course of the next five years having roughly 700 to seven, a little above that uh, in uh, average revenues each year. If you then go down and look at our expenses, um, this is how we would anticipate spending those funds. We have about $160,000 worth of work to complete complete on uh, ongoing projects, the meadow and the front of house landscaping and potentially some work and design work around the dumpster area uh, that's anticipated to start fairly soon. But then we think that if the town were to uh, provide us with a recurring source of uh, support that we would be able to get uh, a fairly accelerated start on at least seven of the eight projects that Catherine Herman has identified in her uh, master plan. And in fact, we think that there's a possibility we could complete all seven of those projects in a three-year time frame, completing them by the end of 2024. And that would have a transformational impact on the appearance of the park. Um, the next line item, which is the Woodland Trails, again, that is the uh, Merritt Parkway Trail uh, project. We would anticipate over the course of the next three years spending roughly 50,000 a year, and it's possible we'll pull some of that forward or push some of that out a little bit, but we would anticipate spending approximately 50,000 uh, per year to begin researching uh, different options for performing that project. Um, and our hope would be that at the end of 2024, probably before the end of 2024, that we'll have the engineering studies and the research completed so that we will have a variety of project options to choose from as far as attenuating sight and sound and improving uh, that trail along the merit. Um, with the hope that we could then actually start work beginning in 25 and 26. So right now we don't have any uh, expenditures on projects in those years, but we would anticipate that uh, we would be in a position to launch uh, that much larger project uh, in those years. And so that cash buildup you're seeing at the bottom of this would actually uh, be considerably less because our expenditures would be much higher than reflected here. Um, so that's a snapshot of what we anticipate. And I'll just, uh, you know, conclude by again summarizing that we respectfully ask the town to allocate 300000 per annum to Waveney Park improvements through the Park and Rec budget. We are confident that we have a well-vetted list of projects that will absorb these funds effectively. And we are committed to partnering with the town to contribute uh, financially meaningfully to those efforts. And we think that if these efforts uh, are, are uh, completed, that they will have a transformational impact uh, on the park and will be extremely well received by a very large number of town residents. And so with that, uh, that concludes the sort of formal presentation. I'm happy to take any questions you have.
So Steve, and same I'll, request. If you could go out of the screen, save uh, the screen share, just so that we can see the uh, the hands that go up and so forth. I'll, I'll while you do that, I'll. I have three things I'd like to say, and then and then just give the board a chance to think of their question. Well, first of all, maybe four things. Obviously, we're not taking a vote on this tonight. This would be part of the budget, you know, in in February when we do the reviews. But it's a, it's good to have this heads up in this review, and that's a great overview of the summary. And Genium Meadow is one of the most amazing things in terms of a development that we've had in the parks in this town, I think probably in 20 years, it's unbelievable. It's a, just a tremendous um, effort project and a beautiful outcome, tremendous, well, really, really well done. Um, three things, one, when you say you're gonna hire an executive director, is that for the building and the parks or just the parks? It is It is just for the parklands. And again, uh, I, I think most of you know this, but right now our purview is strictly the parklands of Waveney. We have no, uh, no jurisdiction or influence over the house itself. Well, that's important for everybody on this call and obviously everybody in the town of New Canaan to know, because I'm not sure everybody makes that distinction. So when you say the town's put $400,000 into the parks, into Waveney, over the last decade, Tiger, you could tell me, but I'm sure we've put millions into the building um, between elevators and ADA and roofs and leaks and everything else. So I, we all understand what you're talking about. It's your, your purview is the parks. But in terms of putting money into Waveney broadly, right, uh, writ large, it's it's uh, it's obviously considerably more than that amount of money. But anyway, more importantly, keeping this conversation onto the parks, which is is your is is the purview and the purpose of this discussion, not the building. Um, you're envisioning that director to only be for the parks, because the, 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 we 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 need to, we we really have to have a strategy for Waveney. And right. we've talked about this before, and we need an executive director for the building, for programming, for weddings, for a million things. So we, this has to be done in sync with, with some of those efforts, obviously, for, I think for obvious reasons. We don't need a director for the park and a director for the house, and they don't get together and work together. That would be, that would be a huge mistake. Okay, so that was that. The building is clearly separate. We've put millions into the building, but um, I do appreciate that separate. Do you have an estimate for the Merritt Parkway trail at this point? Well, as I said, the the sort of forecast that Catherine Herman put together ranges anywhere from 3.5 million yeah. to uh, 4.5 million. Okay. And quite honestly, um, I, I think that is a range that would apply if we were to do earthen berms and possibly move the trail a little bit. So that's a very substantial sure. Sure. project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, informally, we've had some other discussions which uh, suggest, hey, maybe instead of berming the whole thing, you can do berms in some areas, fencing in others, landscaping in others. There are also uh, potentials to do sort of Gambian baskets filled with stones that you can just hoist into place and that let ivy or something grow over them. But quite honestly, until we have more of an opportunity to really research yeah. what goes into that, I don't think we're going to have a, a, okay. a really precise idea. Okay, no, that's fair. You, when but you said it, you broke no up. No matter a little. how you slice it, it's going yeah. to be a big project. That's right. No, totally understand. When you said it, you broke up a little. I just didn't get the number. Okay, uh, questions um, from the rest of the board. Thank you for that. Really terrific. I think it's a great presentation. Um, I One thing I'd like more to see on when we get to the budget meeting is how you size the town contribution. You know, it just seemed kind of arbitrary. Uh, and, I mean, and not that you couldn't even argue for more because it's public purpose, but just why that number, uh, you know, or maybe you did that and I just missed it. I, I did not. Um, I, let's say in the, in the background, I've gotten a little input from certain town officials um, and uh, uh, I, and I think we've been steered in this direction because it matches uh, some of the funding that's being given to other organizations such as the New Canaan Athletic Foundation um, and others. So um, we're trying to be reasonable in our request, but try to make sure that it, uh, that it's, uh, you know, that it conforms with what some other organizations who are involved in a public private partnership are also receiving. So it sounds like the little birdie told you sort of thing. <laughs> little birdies and I've been around the block a little bit to know what's probably a realistic ask versus an unrealistic ask. That said, I mean, it, it is, it is absolutely true that Waveney is one of the most heavily utilized assets and one of the most beloved assets in the town of New Canaan. 
And I think to a certain extent, we as citizens and as a town have taken that asset for, for granted a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and I think when COVID came along, one of the light bulbs that went on is, oh my gosh, this thing has been invaluable to the yeah. town. Okay. Thank God we have this. This is an asset we really need to take care of. And frankly speaking, it, it's always been maintained to a certain level, but there was a lot that could have been done that over the years was not done. And we're now realizing, boy, we can do a lot here. People seem to really value it. Um, the improvements that we've done so far, I mean, get enormous accolades from folks. They really enjoy it. And we've seen a, a huge pickup in usage in certain areas of the park where people really didn't visit much before. Um, I think you could argue for more. I, so, well, that's kind of where I'm going. Uh, I, I think potentially there's a strong argument to be made for more. Well, it's, it's helpful for us to see the bigger picture for that, partly for that reason. Uh, Amy? Yeah, Steve, a great presentation. And, and I, you know, the improvements have been just spectacular. And, and I guess the, the real point of conservancy is enhancing what we have where we've been kind of maintaining it because, you know, the Parks Department does the mowing and, and all that stuff. So it's, uh, you know, this is basically about, you know, making it better. Those guys do a terrific job, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of what's embedded, I mean, these are distinct projects. But what about, and Judy, I think will key in on this one, like the whole tree maintenance expense of it. I know there's a zillion trees, they need a lot of work. Is that part of what the Conservancy is doing? Are we teaming that up more with, um, you know, our tree warden and stuff? Because I, I just know there's a zillion trees and they need, they need work. Is that part of this um, Conservancy game plan? Um well, certainly looking at trees is part of our game plan, and we would like to actually, and, and I don't have a, a detailed plan at this point in time, but I, I know an area that we'd like to give a little bit more attention to is, are there additional trees that we can plant in the park? Um, now, some of our projects will, in all likelihood, necessitate possibly adding some trees in certain areas, possibly taking some trees down in certain areas. Um, and that gets into a discussion with Parks and Rec and with the tree warden. Um, as far as sort of the general maintenance of trees throughout the park, if a tree is falling down or something of that nature, typically the town will, uh, will find find a way to to address that through the general parks and rec uh, budget um, or the the public works budget. Okay. okay. Um, one other thing I, I and I brought this up before got some positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks but um, Waveney Park is a humongous asset for New Canaan but it's an enormous as, asset for the greater community and I know you know if we can think creatively ways that we could have people who are not necessarily New Canaan residents certainly have all the use of the park, but there's some way that we can be able to have these people use it also help contribute um, to the to the park, whether and I, you know, is there a parking pass or something like that? And I just think this is something we should consider going forward in no way trying to keep people from using it, but other areas, there's parks. If you're not a resident, you have to do parking or something. And I, and I think we should just revisit, um, are there ways that we can do that that is not something that puts a significant barrier to people, but that any revenue off of that would go to further enhance the park. I just wouldn't mm -hmm. put that out there again. I, I would I would agree with that. And I would, I would just note on that, that we are aware, well, I think the majority of the users and the routine users of Waveney are from uh, New Canaan. We also know that uh, we get a fair number of Darien residents and some uh, Stanford residents. Um, and in some of our fundraising efforts, for example, our annual appeals, we're now trying to uh, target neighborhoods in, uh, in, for example, Darien that we think are likely sending a number of users to, uh, to Waveney. And you know, it's not an enormous amount of money, but we're beginning to see uh, some donations and revenues come from outside the town as well. Thanks. Any other questions for? Yeah, I just, 
I had a comment. Yeah, Victor, Victor, then Neil. Yep. So my question is, in your budget projections, you have some pretty concrete projects through 2024. But then after that, it just turns into the Merritt Parkway Woodland project. And so um, I, I, I think 300,000 might be the right number for the next couple of years. But would so the concept that you um, um, talked about before about uh, a large donor saying he wanted the town to have skin in the game, would he consider it enough to have skin in the game if the town would um, agree to $300,000 in 2022, 2023, and 2024? And then from that point forward, we would um, reassess the contribution from the town at that point. Um, I, I, the answer to the question is I, I can't speak for what the donor has in mind. I think that they would like to see probably longer runway, um, knowing that the town is going to, on an annual basis, um, uh, devote some recurring funding to, to Waveney. And they're aware of the fact that in terms of dedicated funding that's specifically earmarked for improvements in Waveney, that historically the town really hasn't done that. Um, so, I can't speak to if they see a, a, a number committed to for three years versus five years, um, whether that's something that they're gonna respond to uh, well or have issues with. Um, I think in general, certainly this one funder that I mentioned, but I've heard it from others, they just wanna know that the town, that they're sort of saying, hey, look, if this is owned by the town of New Canaan, it's a town asset and while people in, in New Canaan are, are willing to contribute towards assets of this nature, they shouldn't be expected to do solely the significant majority of the funding. This is a town asset. The town should demonstrate that it's willing to do its fair share as well. So I don't know if that answers your question. but It does. Thank you. Uh, Neil? Yeah, just could I throw on the information request? Uh, you know, Cranberry Park in Norwalk, which has big lawns and also a big mansion on it. Yep. Um, I, I am vaguely familiar with it. Not, uh, not tremendously. It's interesting to see how Norwalk handles that. They, it's a mansion. It's, it's really similar sort of situation. And they let it out for certain events and all that. Um, mm -hmm. Just anything they've learned or the way they fund it or do it or whatever. Or whatever. And then uh, anybody else? Judy, do you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you, Steve, for that presentation. I think we all can agree that certainly during COVID that the importance of open space has been amplified worldwide. I think that's just a given and it will continue. I am concerned though, I'd like to see a plan. I'd like to see more thinking going into sources of revenue. Um, the numbers that were shared with me, I'm not sure if they are right, you would have them. Uh, about the usage of especially Waveney by other towns and residents in all of Fairfield County has also equally exploded. Um, maybe I, I'm back to, I guess, where Neil is. It's, it's time to, to seek some sources here They're coming in or passes or cars or whatever. I just think we ought to be looking at all of this. There's so many similar requests. Well, it gets back to the other point of tying it in possibly as a funding source from the house itself, if it were better managed and That's right. more programming, there could be an opportunity for a revenue source there that could you know, subsidize the, the, the grounds. Um, okay, other questions or thoughts? Steve, thank you very much. Terrific, we'll look forward to having the conversation next month. Okay, thank you all very much. Have a good thank night. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Andy, uh, let's see, over to you, Josh, for a uh, finance update. And then we've got a couple of, I think, um, transfers to discuss. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. So in front of you, you should have the year-to-date financials as of December 31st, 2021. Um, and beginning on the revenue side. Um, Are you about, You're not sharing. So huh? I'm not sharing. I can share if you'd like. We all have it. I don't know if anybody needs it to be shared. So uh, why don't you just, we'll assume that we, we have it on our tablets and, and um, in our sure. emails. So at the halfway point of the year, we're at 
uh, 60% tax collected, which is 5 million over the same point last year. Um, collection of taxes at the prior year is, um, it's about on par with last year, which is 40%, about 40% over what we budgeted, the 300,000. Um, kind of continuing with the building permits, which is two times uh, our year to date at, the, at, the, at this point last year, um, which was budgeted for this year at 800,000. And we currently have collected 700,000. So we're at about 85% of that. Also kind of continuing with the conveyance fees from last year were basically flat from last year, which is still at 23% over what we had originally budgeted 1.1 million. So year to date. Year to date, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 1.3, which is on par with last year's 1.3 as well. Well, just but comparing it to the budget though, we've already exceeded the budget. If I yeah, we yeah. have, we've exceeded by 250,000 or so. Um, and I think last year we ended over 200, over 2 million, 2.4, 2.5. As a, as an aggregate, we are eight percent over last year in terms of revenue, and sixty six percent in terms of our budgeted year to date revenue. Um, on the expense side, we are three percent under uh, last year at that at this point, and forty four percent of our budgeted at fifty percent through the year. So we're pretty much on pace with where we should be for expenses. So just back on revenues, we're 8% we're over budget, we're $7 million to the good. Do, do you have a projection? Can you Are you projecting what you think we may end up? I mean, the taxes will be the taxes, so I don't expect right. any, anything really a, as a lift there, although there could be the prior years be the only thing. So I think in our in our projections for for FY23's budget and kind of uh, seeing where we would end FY22, I think we we kind of spoke about three million beyond what we had budgeted, or three and a half million beyond what we had budgeted for revenue. Okay. Okay. Which is probably primarily from building permits, conveyance fees, yep. and okay. you know things of that nature. Excellent. In Josh parking still. Yeah, we expect parking will probably come in below, right? So, Here we, by right, year. Well, yeah. So parking is, I think it's, it's at forty six percent. So it's you know it's a little bit under, but it's still back obviously from last year, which was which was nothing. Um, but I guess we'll. I'm, I'm not exactly sure if we'll see an uptick in it in, in winter, but. Um, it's not falling too far behind. It's, right. it's at 40, 46%. What's okay, driving well, the uh, $745,000 improvement year over year in other revenues? In other revenues. So there's a couple of things that contribute to that. I think there's a, a transfer in from, from uh, police extra duty funds. There's also some um, recreation, uh, other classes and programs and, and, and classes that are outperforming what we're expected by kind of a large margin, like $180,000, $200,000. So I think those two combined make up a, a good deal of that. Okay. Other questions? For Josh on this, good, good, obviously in a very good place. Yeah. Higher revenues, higher revenues, lower, lower expenses uh, on, on track for um, hopefully a, a solid surplus. Okay, I don't see any hands up. All right, did you want to walk through the transfers just real quickly and then we can? Sure, there, there's just one small dollar transfer for uh, it's $650. It's, uh, you know, from repair emergency equipment to voice and data in the emergency management department, not anything major. Do you need us to vote on that? No, no, no. Okay, all right, okay. Okay. 
All right, anything else? Any other questions for Josh at this point? Okay. All right, well, thanks, Josh. Okay, Thank we're you. going to, um, we're gonna move into executive session. I'm gonna just keep the Board of Finance, uh, obviously, and Chris. Um, and Tiger, I've asked you to be the co-host. We lost um, Tucker. Uh, she, her, her system went down. And if you could help me move everybody into executive session, um, for, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and if you're, you can just drop um, or, or we'll, we'll drop you. But I need a motion um, uh, to move into executive session for the purpose of having a discussion on IT, including cybersecurity. Move. Um, I see Maria moved and, and Neil seconded. Is that correct? I think I actually moved. Oh, Neil moved and Marie second. Okay, all right. All, all in favor? Uh, Judy, please make sure we capture all this. Um, any opposed? None. So we'll 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 move into um, to executive session. So with that, we'll ask everyone else to. Uh, Tiger, you can. We just need the board of finance. Tucker, uh, Tucker, if she comes back, you and- Yes, uh, I, I'm okay. here. I'm just trying to work through my phone now. I've lost okay. all my Thank cell you. services. Thanks everybody for being patient about that. And I did not invite anybody other than Tucker and Tiger and um, Chris. You're on mute, Tucker. Tiger, are you there now that you have uh, co-host ability? I'm working through the list right now, Tucker. All right, and then pause the recording if you could. Okay. I know, <laughs> it's a lot of people. Take, you have to do it one by one. Okay. All right, I think, I think I have more. How many, how many members do you have, nine? Let's see, we don't have Hamill. Um, yeah, everybody's here. Calm's here. Maria, Amy? I think you're good. Neil, I'm looking good. at the list. Tom, Judy, that's right. Mike and Victor. Okay, and Chris, yep. you're on? Yeah. Nine. Okay. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Chris okay. Kaiser, Chris Kaiser, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, we're good. So, and uh, if you pause the recording, Tiger, thank you for, for your help. Your help on that. Uh, okay, I don't think we have anything else on our agenda. So, unless there's any other questions we have, um, I'll have a motion to adjourn. All right, Michael, uh, call him second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. Thank you, everyone. Good meeting, good updates, and um, we'll have a lot going on over the next six weeks. Thanks in advance, and thanks for your support tonight. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Uh,